Nice versions. The J7 Modification 2 is almost identical to its Soviet siblings, while the E version boasts a unique wing. But how about a double MiG? Surprisingly, that's the kind of task the Chinese aviation engineers once received. And here's what they made. The aircraft's power plant is two turbojet engines with afterburners. Self-sealing fuel tanks are found in the wing and the fuselage, while the nose cone hides a radar system. Fixed armament consists of a 23mm autocannon with an ammo pool of 200 rounds. The aircraft can also carry conventional bombs and rockets, as well as infrared and radar-guided air-to-air missiles. The key part of this machine is its power plant. Two engines provide a high thrust-to-weight ratio, which in turn means excellent dynamics and climb rates. And no one ever thought the regular MiG-21 had a shortage of it in the first place. The increase in power didn't affect the maximum speed, however. It's limited by the wing's capabilities, much like on its predecessors. We definitely wouldn't recommend accelerating past 1,360 km per hour near the ground unless you want to turn into a starfighter. Now, one might assume that adding another engine would make the aircraft big, heavy, or clumsy, like some Phantom. But it actually didn't. The increased size had little effect on maneuverability. The J-8 does a great job at turning towards the enemy, and you don't really need much more from a top fighter. It has two types of missiles against enemy air. The IR homing PL-5B for close range and the radar-guided Uspita for long distances. Both do their jobs just as well as their counterparts from other nations. Now, the fixed armament of the J-8 leaves much to be desired. Its ammo pool can only last 3.5 seconds of continuous use, and with a low fire density, it's far from the best choice for gun duels. As for countermeasures, it's a mixed bag for this fighter. I mean, it does have some, which is already a matter of envy for some competitors. The Mirage, the Draken, the Starfighter, the Nesher, and the F-1 fighters can only have flares in front of their noses. But there are only 64 of them, and even despite their increased caliber, they might not last the entire battle. Close air support isn't the strongest role for this Chinese fighter. You can destroy tanks with its rockets and 500-pound bombs, but it's a tricky task without a ballistic computer. What the J-8 does great is clearing the skies of enemy aircraft, providing a major contribution towards victory and ensuring the safety of Allied vehicles. The Ferdinand self-propelled guns occupy a special place in the history of German armored vehicles. There are so many myths about their creation and battle engagement that these machines are no doubt legendary. They also had just as legendary a predecessor, the Porsche Tiger. By the way, many made-up stories and misconceptions accumulated around the wartime activities of the Porsche company. You can often hear that the SPG was actually the idea of Ferdinand Porsche himself. They'd say Porsche was making his Tiger for a competition but lost to Henschel and decided to use the hulls for the SPGs. In fact, Porsche was only a design bureau back in those years, nothing else. Both Tigers were made according to official contracts, with Steyr factories assembling both Porsche Tiger and Ferdinand machines. No independent action was allowed in producing vehicles, of course. Due to urgency, the Germans put the Tigers into production with no preliminary testing, right off the blueprints. No wonder the first tanks had heaps of issues and assembly plans were shattered. The Porsche Tiger was the most notable issue producer. It had a new unique suspension, new air-cooled engines, and an electric transmission. Unlike other German tanks, it had rear-leading wheels, while pneumatic brakes were in the front. No one had any idea about their real-world performance. And soon, the number of issues became so overwhelming they had to stop the assembly lines for Porsche Tigers. What could they do next? They could try to polish both Tigers, but didn't they have enough issues with just one? On the other hand, discarding an entire project would be a shame with so much time and effort spent. So the Germans found a compromise. The Henschel Tiger would be mass-produced, while the Porsche Tiger designs would be used to create a self-propelled gun. 
It was still a complicated task that required new solutions, but Porsche engineers weren't new to bold experiments. The first thing they had to solve was the layout. The new, more powerful cannon had such a long barrel that they couldn't simply replace the turret with a casemate. The German army already had SPGs with a casemate in the rear and engines right below it. It made repairs difficult even with open-top compartment vehicles, so they had to find another solution for the Ferdinand. So the engines and the generators were placed in the center. Now only the casemate had to be removed to access the electric drives. The suspension units were outside so they could be replaced in the field, while the road wheels didn't overlap. The engineers were worried about their brainchild. They didn't have enough time to polish the Porsche Tiger, and yet they had more issues to work on. Could a 65-ton SPG be reliable? How do you tow and repair it? How would the electric transmission perform in battle? The Ferdinand's first actual combat went off the plan. Originally, they had to follow the infantry and lighter vehicles, providing covering fire. But during the Battle of Kursk, the Ferdinands found themselves in the front and in a minefield. No wonder so many of them became immobilized. Moreover, the summer of 1943 was hot and dry, leading to dust clogs and overheating in the engines. Still, this machine was theoretically the best in the world in terms of armor and firepower at the time. By winter, they'd gained enough experience in employing the Ferdinands, so in December of 1943, the remaining machines were sent to Austria for a major overhaul. The SPGs received commander's cupolas, machine guns for the radio operator, and a new toolbox in the rear. A month before the overhaul, the Ferdinands were renamed into Elephants, which led many to mistakenly believe that the Elephants were improved Ferdinands. In fact, both names were used in parallel. After the overhaul, the Elephants were sent to Italy, where they demonstrated notable performance. They say there was a battle where two Elephants fought around 50 American tanks for 10 hours and damaged roughly 30 of them. It's hard to say how much truth there is to it, but there's no doubt that they might well have pulled it off with their armor and firepower. Later, some of the Elephants were brought back to the Eastern Front, where they remained until the end of the war. The Porsche engineers took a great technical risk developing their Tiger, and it certainly paid off. The Ferdinands, based on that Tiger, sustained two years of heavy battles and earned their fame as fearsome machines. Not long ago, pilots of some top aircraft received an updated suspended armament selection menu. We know how much you wanted this feature, and honestly speaking, we're a bit tired of manually composing dozens of weapon loadouts ourselves. So let's talk about these new opportunities. We'll start with the list of aircraft that enjoy this new system. Currently, eight machines of different nations have it available, a couple of American A-10s, the German MiG-23 MLA, and the Su-22 UM-3K, today's Metal Beast, the Chinese J-8, the top Italian Starfighter and French Mirage planes, and the Israeli Kfir C-2. But very soon, with the Danger Zone update, more top planes will receive the custom loadouts, as well as all Phantom and MiG-21, 23, and 27 planes, which will increase the total past 30 machines, and more are coming. To create your first loadout, select a plane, go to Suspended Armament, and press Create in the bottom left. You'll see a line of squares representing your plane's hardpoints. If you click on a square, you'll see a list of weapons you can load onto this hardpoint. Aircraft upgrades and unlockable modules will add to the list of available weaponry, as expected. It makes sense to consider possible activities and battle conditions when creating a loadout. You're unlikely to need bombs and air-to-surface missiles in air combat, so why take them? The opposite is also true. No use taking a full set of AA missiles for mixed battles. You can only create a custom loadout in your hangar, not in battle, so think through future scenarios in advance. For instance, we don't recommend simply going for the top weapons on attack aircraft. Having a few different sets is better. There's more than one reason for that. First, each bomb and missile increases your respawn cost. It would be a shame to not be able to take off at all because you're only missing a few points. You wish you could drop a few bombs, right? Second, 
Each weapon has its own mass that affects the flight performance of the carrier in a major way. There's no sense in carrying a bunch of heavy bombs if you expect to suppress enemy AA defense with guided missiles. You'll have way better chances with no flight performance penalty. On some machines, it's possible to lay out the same weapon set in different ways. Pay attention to the type of your ordnance in that case. For instance, large caliber bombs can be dropped with equal precision from both the wing and the belly hard points, while rockets are more convenient when they're closer to the center of your plane. Bear in mind that payload capacity is limited. You won't be able to take enough bombs to prevent takeoff. As for different wing loads, it's a bit trickier. If you fill out all the hard points on one side and leave the other empty, the game will warn you about it and won't allow you to save this loadout. However, it doesn't mean all your loadouts have to be symmetrical. You can have an uneven spread of the weight, but only within reasonable limits, individual for each plane. Well, that's it for the loadouts. Get creative, give them unique names for quick navigation, and favorite them to find them faster. Share your experience in the comments. Meanwhile, we'll be answering some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called Dio Helang Ramadan. Why can't I launch TV-guided rockets or bombs at night? Hi, Dio. There's no mistake here. Such munitions can't be used when it's dark. The reason behind that is that their homing devices seek out points or groups of objects on the ground with a high contrast and use them as guidance. And they simply can't do that at night. Tithanos asks, Does the nuke get unlocked at 6.7 or 7.0? Hi there. Currently, the nuclear bomber becomes available at a BR of 6.7. It's either the B-29 or the 2-4. Another question comes from Pahor95. How do I use suspension on a Japanese MBT? Hi, Pahor. All the settings you need can be found in controls, ground vehicles, suspension control. As for tactics, you might need the suspension in closed positions, such as to improve your depression angles or decrease the visibility of your tank's outline. 439 Sparky1 writes, Do you pick comments to read for the next episode throughout the entire week? Hi, Sparky. As a rule of thumb, we collect comments from multiple aired episodes. So if your question isn't there in the next episode, chances are we haven't gotten to it yet. And the last comment for today was written by Blaue Stoffel. You should also have rated the turning circle for the wheeled tanks. Hey there. It isn't important enough to have a full stage dedicated to it, so we didn't show it in the triathlon. But we can have it right here if you want. Let's line up the participants and go. The best result is shown by the German machine. Then we have the Centauro, then the Chinese, American, and Japanese vehicles showing similar results. And the biggest circle belongs to the Ruikat. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. And the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to leave a like. Remember to give your smart missiles a pep talk before you launch them for that extra speed. Share your thoughts and comments. And see you next week. After World War II, the UK introduced the first ever main battle tank, the legendary Centurion. British engineers managed to combine the best qualities of several classes of tanks, sturdy armor, decent mobility, and good firepower, all in one neat package. Thanks to its outstanding performance, the Centurion remained in service all around the globe till the very end of the century. In War Thunder, there are several Centurion variants that can be found in the British, the Swedish, and the Israeli tech trees. But what's their designated combat role? As envisioned by the British engineers that designed them, Centurions are highly versatile tanks that remain effective in any combat conditions. Tanks of the series have better armor than other first-generation Western MBTs, but aren't as well protected as the Soviet ones. Most Centurions have a max speed of 35 kilometers per hour, which means that their counterparts are usually faster. 
But British vehicles make up for that with good acceleration and their ability not to bleed speed on any terrain. If you're fighting on a small or medium-sized map, a Centurion will always be among the first tanks to reach key areas of the map, or at least will get there right after the Vanguard. Another key feature of this tank family is that these tanks are equipped with powerful, quick-firing cannons. British engineers made sure that these guns were as convenient to use as possible. They have decent elevation and come with sub-caliber rounds with excellent ballistics. Furthermore, all Centurions except for the Mark I are equipped with a two-plane stabilizer. They're an excellent pick if you're into careful, deliberate gameplay. Just find yourself a position that allows you to cover several key areas, like positions that are next to B on Finland. The first vehicle of the series, the Mark I, is available only to the Brits. This tank combines the key strengths of its Soviet, German, and American counterparts. Its upper glacis plate can withstand hits coming from medium tanks. Its armament allows it to pierce the defenses of heavy tanks. Its mobility? Well, it's not perfect, but it's perfectly manageable. Mark I tanks also have access to APDS rounds, allowing British tankers to be among the first to master using this type of ammo. If you're new to this round, we suggest that you should aim at the target's center of mass, or in the case of especially large vehicles, at the turret, close to the mantlet, to destroy the breach and to knock out the enemy gunner. Furthermore, thanks to its fast reload, the Mark I performs pretty well in a fight against several opponents. First disarm them, then deal the final blow. Finally, the last big selling point of the tank is the fact that it can launch smoke grenades, allowing you to create smoke screens that have a lot of tactical utility. The Mark III is, unsurprisingly, also found in the British tech tree. It received a sturdier turret and a new 20-pounder with a two-plane stabilizer. This tank is equally effective at long range and in CQC. Just keep in mind that its six times magnification sight for the gunner isn't always up to the task in long range engagements. At extreme ranges, it's good to switch to the commander's optics as they have a max magnification of 10 times. And be very careful. Despite receiving a new turret, the tank's armor arrangement is pretty much the same. Export Centurions, the Swedish Stridsvagen 81 and the Israeli Schott, perform in a similar fashion. The Mark 10, as well as its Swedish variant, the Stridsvagen 101, both sit at rank 5. They're almost a carbon copy of the Mark 3, apart from some additional armor on the hull and a new gun. The 105mm L7 cannon, which has a slower fire rate but is noticeably more powerful. Soon the UK stopped developing new tanks of the series, but their foreign clients weren't ready to give up on their older models. Israel, for instance, kept on modernizing Centurions. The first Israeli vehicle of this type was the Shot Kal Aleph, equipped with a more powerful power pack from the M60 and a new transmission allowing it to reach a speed of 48 kilometers per hour. It was followed by the Shot Kal Gimel, which also received a new Israeli-made 105mm Sharir cannon, a laser rangefinder, as well as a Blazer ERA. At rank 6, we find two more tanks, influenced by the work of Israeli engineers. The South African Oliphant Mark 1A and the Swedish STRV 104. These modified Centurions are best used as snipers as they take a long time reaching max speed and aren't particularly well protected. On the other hand, their quick reload, laser rangefinders, and powerful M111 APF SDS rounds make them extremely dangerous at long ranges. Naturally, both tanks are especially effective on big maps with hilly terrain like Sands of Sinai. The most modern vehicles of the series are found in the British and the Swedish tech trees. The STRV-105 isn't that different from the preceding model, but the Oliphant Mark II is basically a completely new design, which is only fair, thanks to a new transmission and a new 1,050 horsepower engine. Its mobility is almost on par with modern MBTs. The turret of the tank was reinforced with composite armor, improving its survivability, and sights for both gunner and commander were equipped 
with thermal imaging, making it very easy to search for targets. South African engineers basically breathed a second life into the vehicle, allowing it to reclaim its title of a true universal tank. Finally, there are quite a few Centurions that are event vehicles or premium vehicles. The British Action X and the Australian Mark V-1 are similar to the Mark III in the firepower department, but the latter has additional armor, while the Action X requires clever position, as it's best used when making full use of a hull-down position. The British and Swedish tech trees also include the premium STRV-81, which is equipped with Robot.52 first-generation ATGMs. The premium British AVRE, as well as the FV4202, which is part of the regular tech tree, are very different from other vehicles of the series. The AVRE is armed with a short-barreled demolition gun that's not very effective at range, but is devastating up close. The FV4202 is an experimental vehicle which was an amalgamation of the experience gleaned over years of developing Centurions. This is the slowest tank in the family, and it looks a bit like the Action X because of its new mantletless turret. Finally, in the British tech tree, there's also one more rare premium vehicle, the Schutkal Dalet, which is a modernized Centurion, like the STRV-104 or the early Oliphant. Centurions will have their uses in any combat conditions and on any battlefield. Thanks to their powerful cannons and decent armor, they will always be a reliable pick for an experienced tanker. And what do you think about this series of tanks? Tell us in the comments below. Welcome to Thunder Show, where we showcase the most interesting, odd, and fun things that our players send to us. Today's episode may be titled in a straightforward way, What on Earth Was That? Get ready to be surprised by a fierce Mi-24, a Zis-30 SPG, two guests from the past, and an unlucky Jaguar with a nuke. Let's get started. A true communist isn't afraid of frontal attacks. They'd rather hand in their party card. The only thing left for the Mi-24's pilot to do is pot shoot their rockets at the enemy Iroquois. Before being shipped in pieces to the hangar screen, the enemy manages to wreck the Soviet heli's rotor. And a couple seconds before hitting the ground, our winner also manages to down a Cobra at a pretty great distance. You don't see this kind of chopper rocket action often. Here's your gold. Velor on their Jaguar here is the Horseman of the Apocalypse closing in on the battlefield. No way to stop them. They're almost celebrating. But wait, the enemy team has a nuke-carrying Jaguar too. The bombs are dropped almost at the same time. Now that's some adrenaline. It's almost decided. And... The enemy Jaguar is late by basically a split second. Victory! Where's our nuke book? And here we have a Zis-30 attacking across a ruined bridge. They're approaching the breach. Meanwhile, the unsuspecting M-22 is hanging out below. The tank destroyer drops down and lands right onto the enemy, squashing it with its weight. 5,000 eagles for this leap of faith. Welcome to another episode of the Guests from the Past thriller series. Pepega Stale leads their duck to a modern battlefield. Here's a challenger carelessly ignoring the museum exhibit, coking up the skies, only to be swiftly sent to the hangar with a 75mm round. We always recommend choosing properly ranked vehicles for the battles, but this is a skillful shot indeed. Bring in the gold. Now to some bombing news. An enemy Arado is aiming at a Bradley crawling below. One bomb away. Denied. What was that? Did they actually shoot the bomb mid-air with the autocannon? Well, whatever. The bomber goes for a second approach with another bomb, and we see another mid-air boom. This Bradley is better than actual SPAAs. And 
and now it's time to reward the best works on live War Thunder. This week's prize goes to Delta Akato, author of the Tank Maze Map. A genius idea. Can you find your way through? One more thing for today. We've seen multiple comments asking, will I get an email if my moment isn't featured on Thunder's show? Unfortunately, or fortunately, we can't send so many messages. Our team goes through a few thousand replays a week and it'd be physically impossible. But we do read every email we get. Not a single one stays unopened. Looking forward to getting your replays. Bye. The Shooting Range. In this episode, Pages of History, the Soviet fighter's small ammo. Special, abandoned town in the mountains. And Metal Beasts, air superiority, the American way. Today, we're beginning to tell you about the new vehicles introduced by the Danger Zone update. And you're probably familiar with this metal beast. The first fourth generation fighter and the latest member of the Grumman feline family, a famous actor, and a pretty hard boiled aircraft. All of this is the top American carrier based plane, the F 14A Tomcat. We often admire the shapes and grace of combat aircraft, but this machine feels like a different breed altogether. With its wings spread wide, the Tomcat looks like it just left the gym after a workout, straightened its back, and flexed its muscles, the tough steel muscles of an American plane. With the wings swept back, it's a swift, ruthless hunter, streamlined and whole like an arrowhead. Still, it's great in more than just the looks. The aircraft's power plant is two turbojet engines with afterburners. The space in the wing and the fuselage is occupied by fuel tanks. The nose cone hides the onboard radar station, and under the cockpit, we can see a 20 mm auto cannon with an ammo pool of 676 rounds. The plane's eight hardpoints can carry bombs of various calibers, rockets, and guided air to air missiles with infrared and radar guided homing devices. As per its design, the F-14 focuses on air combat. Two powerful engines provide fairly good acceleration and climb rates, while its perfect aerodynamics and great structural integrity allow it to accelerate up to 1,500 kilometers per hour near the ground. Very few top fighters can boast this capability, and that feature dictates the optimal combat tactics for the Tomcat, energy fighting. The Tomcat's pretty good in dogfights, too, but only at high speeds. It quickly loses energy if you try to turn to the enemy too quickly, making it an easy target. Which means you might want to try and stay away from the dangerous area in combat. The Tomcat can carry a hefty arsenal of air-to-air -air missiles to improve its chances, aided by a vigorous radar system capable of locating and tracking targets across the entire battlefield. For long-distance attacks, this American plane can carry the famous Phoenix missiles. Their engines work in eco-mode to provide maximum flight distance. However, that also means the missile's dynamics are inferior to medium and short-range counterparts. The Phoenix missiles can't boast a high maneuverability either. After all, they were created to intercept heavy-laden bombers and cruise missiles, so basically any fighter can dodge them if they spot the approaching trail quickly enough. On the other hand, the AIM-54 has an obvious advantage, the combined homing system. For the majority of the flight, the missile tracks its target using the carrier plane's reflected radar. But sometime before the hit, it switches to its own radar, and the F-14 doesn't have to track it anymore. Still the backbone of the Tomcat's firepower in War Thunder is composed of the familiar Sidewinder and Sparrow missiles. These are way more suitable for close combat. Here's what we believe is a perfect loadout. Two Phoenix missiles in the back under the fuselage, two AIM-7 in front of them, and IR-guided AIM-9 for the wing hardpoints. As a last resort, the Tomcat can also use its trusty old 20 millimeter Vulcan, the quick firing autocannon. The F-14 isn't that great at attacking ground vehicles and outright bad if you compare it to versatile Phantoms. 
A few Zuni rockets and conventional bombs with calibers up to 2,000 pounds can destroy tanks, and there's even a ballistic computer to aid your aiming. 